Tom Manzo, and I'm president of the California Business and Industrial Alliance. We're a trade association dedicated to bringing awareness to a crisis that affects every employer and freelancer in California. It's a crisis we call PAGA. Today's guest is State Senator Shannon Grove. Shannon, welcome to the show. I appreciate having you on today. Thank you very much. Oh, Tom, thank you very much. You know, I know we've had hit and miss trying to get this set up, but I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to come on. So a lot of our viewers, they might not know who uh, Shannon Grove is, you know, and, and you're our state senator in Bakersfield. And what drove you? What what made you want to get into politics in the first place? Well, um, so I'm a business owner, obviously. Um, I've been a business owner in this state for 24 years in spite of this state is how I feel sometimes. Yeah. And um, I had a workers' comp problem. So I took my workers' comp problem to then my assembly member, Kevin McCarthy, and I wheeled my little dolly in there with all of my uh, files. And I told him I expected him to fix it. So we actually worked on a piece of legislation on workers' comp when Kevin was in the assembly. And um, a few months after that, he kept inviting me to these events and going to these you know, places. Uh, Congressman Bill Thomas retired. Kevin took a position in Congress, which created an opening in the assembly. Senator Fuller uh, got elected to office and they still continued inviting me to these events. And I didn't know I was being wooed into politics. And then when Senator Fuller, then Assembly Member Fuller ran for state Senate, it created an opening in the assembly. And Kevin asked me to run for that assembly seat, kind of like I've asked you to run for an assembly seat or <laughs> Anna, right, to run yeah. for an assembly seat. And so um, uh, I ran for the assembly seat and I ran against an incumbent person that had uh, been on a local school board and held local elected office. And we won by 78% of the vote. So not bad. I served six years in the state assembly. I was really done with politics. Obviously, I took two years off, and um, my husband and I thought, "Wow, thank God that time period in our life is over." But a lot of people had talked to me about running for the Senate seat, so we opened an account to run for Senate, and um, we had an event. We had a tremendous groundswell of support in the district. So here I am, uh, the senator for the 16th Senate District, which has Tulare. Uh, to Larry Kern and San Bernardino counties. And then I got elected as the Senate Republican leader um, a few weeks after I got elected to the Senate. I'm the first female veteran that's ever served in the California State Legislature um, at all. And then in both houses and in leadership. And um, I'm a business owner and I was hit with a PAGA lawsuit and workers comp and all the ridiculous things that we face every day just to give somebody a job and an opportunity to provide for their family and treat them with respect and dignity. Um, it's almost impossible in this state. So that's kind of what got me into politics. Sure. Sure. All right. Well, thank you for your service. So so your business, what, what actually was your business doing and what was that PAGA lawsuit all about? So I uh, am an employment service provider and we have clients that we put, uh, we give people an opportunity to get a full-time job. It lets people work 90 days on our payroll and then they go on to um, get hired on so that the uh, client company can, you know, like, uh, you know, make sure they're going to be a good employee and make sure that they didn't, you know, do something wrong on the interview and that they are who they say they are. And so uh, we had the opportunity to give people a job. And my evil, horrible, awful PAGA thing that I did is we pay every week, every Friday, my employees for 25 years have received a paycheck. And I have never, ever, ever um, missed a pay period. I've never, you know, if there's an error on someone's check, we immediately fix it. Um, you know, like if someone's time didn't get turned in, we immediately take care of that. Um, everybody's always been paid on time, always been paid the right amount of money. And my horrible thing that I did as an employer in this state for 25 years is on my paycheck stubs, I say week ending 7-1, week ending 7-8. So I have the week ending date. And the law under Labor Code Section 226 requires you to have inclusive dates. So it's 71278 instead of week ending dates. And that cost me um, over a million dollars um, wow. just the settlement piece and um, the attorney's fees. It cost us, we had to shut down uh, three offices. We sold equipment, we sold vehicles. 
Um, we laid off staff. We reduced staff. We reduced people's salaries, um, wages. I quit taking a paycheck. It was um, detrimental to this business. Um, yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, it's because I had weekending date on my paycheck stub, and the law requires you to have inclusive dates. Well, that's kind of how we first met. Is I was. Uh, running a manufacturing company in, in Southern California. And our big violation was uh, late lunches because we had a flexible work schedule, even though nobody ever complained about the late lunches. And, and when I say late lunches, it means anything past five hours. So some of them were five and a half, some of them were six hours. Um, and everybody got some their lunch. The where some of them are when, you know, we used to be able to let our employees, hey, I'm going to skip my lunch and leave 45 minutes early sure. so, or an hour early so I can go watch my kid play softball. And, or, hey, I'm going to do this. So I schedule my, you know, hair appointment at the end of the day or whatever. And you're not allowed to be nice to employees anymore. No. And we even had a, a safety incentive program. And I thought it wasn't really, uh, you know, the, the dollar amount, more the fun amount. And that ended up being off. And we were off by pennies. And between the late lunches and the, uh, and the safety incentives cost the company a million dollars, and that's that's how I met uh, how, that's how I met you, Shannon. I reached out to you. And you did. You saw a video on. You were the <laughs> I, for a long time. I referred to you as the crazy guy that tracked me down on Facebook. <laughs> you saw a video I did on Paga, and you called me and reached out on Facebook, and we connected. And um, I went down to Pacoima, and I visited Timely, and I talked to your employees and not just your employees that are on executive staff. I mean, I went out on the floor, you took me, you introduced me to people, you introduced me to a gentleman and I, I don't recall his name and I'm sorry that had worked there for years and then retired and then really didn't like retirement. So you brought him back um, and he kind of set his own hours and does his own thing. And, and then you introduced me to employees that you have multi-generation uh, employees that work there. You have parents, grandparents, grandchildren. And that Cousins, was nephews. late lunch. You, yeah. They kind of started at an early shift or a midday shift and they all wanted to eat lunch together. So somebody took a little bit of an early lunch. Somebody took a little bit of a late lunch and that caused a problem. And it's just outrageous how PAGA attorneys just distort, um, you know, the goodness that employers have with their employees. What I thought the amazing part was, was Shannon, that, you know, at that time you we're not in the uh, assembly at that time. You were just kind of on your own. And here you are in Bakersfield and, and you get this call from somebody in, in Pacoima and you drive all the way down and, and, and come visit and meet with everybody. And, and really that's when we kind of established a friendship and, and I think we've been, been friends ever since. So, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You were, you were at our first uh, Kabi a trade association, uh, association meeting before we were even a trade association. So thank well, you. I appreciate um, that you. friendship, Tom. And, and, you know, I, I ran across a lot of people in this state that are upset about um, PAGA, the way employers are treated. And um, they do a lot of griping and complaining, but they very rarely execute um, something as effective as you have executed with Kabia and getting other employers involved um, to stand and fight um, for the every average day, you know, the everyday average employer that is just trying to make ends meet and provide a job for people to be able to provide for their families. Right. And very few people take it, um, any steps towards that. And I don't know anybody that has taken it to the links that you have taken it to, to bring awareness so that employers have the opportunity um, to engage and participate in, in the real fight that's out there to keep jobs in California. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. So let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, I would like to talk about a couple of bills. And I know you deal with hundreds, thousands of bills, but let's uh, let, let's discuss a couple of them. And I'd like to get your input and take on it and, and let the viewers know what you think. No, absolutely. Let's do that. <laughs> The Office of Management and Budget in Washington that's responsible for the budget, putting, up, putting the budget together, cannot even tell you how many boards, commissions, agencies, bureaus, and departments there are in the federal government. Yeah. But all of them can pass regulations. And those regulations have the force of law. And the difference is, when you break the law, you're innocent until proven guilty. When you break a regulation, 
the fellow that charges you with the breaking the regulation, you're guilty. Right. And if you want to take him to court and prove you're innocent, that's up to you. PAGA is an unprecedented transfer of power. And, and let me just focus on that. Unprecedented. There isn't a law like it in any other state. The federal government of the United States does not have a law like PAGA. In drafting this complaint, we got down to the nuts and bolts of what the legislature did in 2004 when they drafted this law. What was most shocking, the legislature understood every one of these issues that's raised in this complaint in 2004. Rather than do their job and focus on what a proper delegation of power would be where the state retains the control, the legislature decided to give the plaintiff's bar and their clients unfettered state authority to go after every business in the state of California. What happened at Timely with PAGA is, um, you know, the, the, the whole atmosphere within the company, it's changed completely. Um, I could tell that everybody feels it, you know, from uh, not being able to enjoy our flexible work schedules, you know, where people used to take their breaks with other family members, which now they can't because maybe they have different positions and, you know, different hours that they come in at. So they, they have to take their lunch breaks and their regular breaks at different times. Uh, you know, we used to get uh, safety bonuses. We used to get we used to get um, Christmas bonuses, which you know we can no longer get due to these this, these lawsuits. Paga is all about helping attorneys and not uh, the employees, and that definitely needs to change. Guess who got a Paga notice this week? Tom Steyer, 2020 Incorporated. Now, Tom Steyer is the co-chairman of the Governor's Economic Advisory Council. If he's anything like the rest of us, he won't have time for frivolous things like coronavirus or restarting the economic engine of California. He'll be too busy, drowning in paperwork, tied up in red tape, and melting under the weight of his own guilt. You see, under the Private Attorneys General Act, an employer is guilty until proven guilty. Welcome to the upside down world of California labor law, Mr. Steyer. Give Sacramento our love, won't you? Okay, so welcome back, Shannon. And, you know, one bill that, that I wanted to discuss uh, that didn't even get voted on was SB 729. And SB 729 uh, was a PAGA reform bill. And, and that particular PAGA reform bill was going to people that were working from home commuting uh, were going to have the ability to not sue for taking late lunches or, or missed breaks or even missed meal periods. And um, somehow uh, the California Labor Federation stepped in and said that bill would significantly uh, weaken the basic right to meal and rest periods. I mean, come on, you've got somebody working at home and, and, and you mean to tell me they're not gonna get their, their, their meal and rest period on time? I, I find that comment and that stance totally absurd. And, and the bill doesn't even get voted on. Uh, what did you hear about the bill? Did you hear anything? What was, what so, was your take? Uh, and like I said, I appreciate you going through some of the detail because, you know, when I talk to people or any trade associations, they always go, what do you think about AB this or SB that? And I'm like, give me content <laughs> because, you know, you're focused on the issues that affect you, but I deal right. with thousands of bills, right? So I have to have a little bit more detail. But yeah, that was a PAGA reform bill. It was introduced and it didn't even get a hearing and you couldn't even get a vote on it because Labor Fed um, is very, very powerful in the building. And I say the building in the Sacramento State Capitol. And it's absurd that this simple solution to PAGA reform um, would not even get a, a vote. I mean, just like you said, realistically with this COVID-19 situation, every a tremendous amount of people have switched from being at the office to working at home. And you're, you know, dressed from the waist up, but you're in your pajamas and your house shoes and from the waist down and you're doing Zoom calls all day uh, and you can leave and go, you know, to your refrigerator, take a break, do whatever you want, set your schedule. Um, and they wouldn't even allow them uh, to be employers that where people work from home would be exempt from these frivolous um, extortion lawsuits. And 
I guess my question is, is to Labor Fed and, and where we operate in Democrat land, what's, how does an employer um, oversee the care, custody, and control of an employee's workday while they're in their own home, right? They're at their house. It's not like you can barge into someone's house and say, did you take your break? Um, I mean, it's just nuts. It really is nuts. There were several reform packages that were introduced regarding PAGA, simple fixes that would have made it fair um, for employers um, and employees per se, because just like your employees and my employees, um, there was one person that got a, a, an, extin an extension of a, a, in, in a, a benefit, like a higher benefit, almost right. recruited right. by the trial attorneys to file the lawsuit. And all of our other employees suffered over that. And just like your employees, their, their work time and stuff like that was taken away from them because you couldn't allow them to choose their own schedule. And it's absurd that we in the state of California can't even get a simple fix for a PAGA that's a common sense fix to help employers and employees have a, a better workplace. And, and I think what a lot of people don't realize is, is in reality, PAGA, uh, it, there's all kind of victims to PAGA. There's, there's nonprofits that, that are hit on a regular basis, you know, small companies, religious institutions, uh, you know, it's not always the, the, the big companies that are being hit. And I really think at a certain point, it's really not a, a Democrat or Republican thing. This is something that affects anybody that has an employee. You could have two employees and you can end up in a PAGA lawsuit. Uh, I talked to somebody who's a contractor for 29 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. All they do is they, they do decks. He's been doing it that long, has four employees and one of them filed a PAGA lawsuit on him. And the, and the poor man is devastated and it will put him out of business without a doubt, without an absolute doubt at all. It's, it's really sad. And, and I, I don't wanna keep going into the fact of, of the aftermath of a PAGA lawsuit. So not only like our company, um, it's, we struggled to pay that penalty. And what's really, what's really um, frustrating about a PAGA suit, so, you know, somebody listening might be go, oh, you paid a, a penalty, so therefore you were at fault. You know, there's two there's two phases of the trial or two phases of the case, which you know, right? There's a liability phase and a right. penalty phase. So we could be found of zero liability, like there was no harm to the employee. Everybody got paid. There's no issues. There was no harm to anyone. So the liability phase could be completely dismissed. But the penalty phase is never dismissed, even if there's no harm to the employee. So um that's another piece of this is that's frustrating and people don't think about the aftermath of the businesses like you know we had uh, companies that provide company vehicles right they don't provide company vehicles anymore because um if you are outside washing your company vehicle that's considered work time um people are not providing cell phones because if you charge a cell phone at your house that's provided to you by your employer they're saying that that should be compensated um all of these ridiculous things that these attorneys are throwing at the wall and they're, it's being allowed to stick is harming the work environment, the employee, their families, and the employer because it's, it's, it's just not a good environment to be in a, a job creator in the state of California and deal with a PAGA situation. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just talk really briefly about uh, AB5. You know, what a disaster uh, this whole law has been from start to finish. I mean, you know, a law that I think was created just to try to unionize uh, the large employers, the Ubers, the Lyfts, the, the big trucking companies, and uh, it backfired because of Prop 22, uh, but we still have a lot of people uh, that are, you know, independent contractors who aren't going to be able to function and it's it's a mess ab5 is a total mess uh, do you think that there's any chance at all that they're going to repeal it after it's been shaken down and stripped down so much what are your thoughts on ab5 so i agree with you completely that ab5 is a disaster a complete disaster and the democrats in the building um, and i'm not trying to be partisan it was obviously passed by a democrat a democrat legislator Lorena Gonzalez down in um, San Diego area, signed by a Democrat governor, complete opposition from every Republican in the building, both on the assembly side and the, um, or excuse me, one member 
uh, which is no longer um, in office because of that vote. That that vote. Um, so it wasn't uh, re, uh, supported by Republicans. And I'm not trying to be partisan. I'm just trying to say that we are so outnumbered in that building that if there's not going to be a repeal process. Um, there, there really isn't. When you look at the state Senate seats, right, we have nine members and there's 40 state senators in the state of California. So you have nine members fighting to allow people to have worker freedom. And then you have um, one vacancy and 30 members fighting to take worker freedom away from um, workers. And so you have to have 21 to pass a repeal and we just don't have the votes. Yeah. So that's the frustrating piece. But I can tell you that even my colleagues on the other side of the aisle really know that AB5 is a complete disaster because they've had the same complaints that we get. There was such a, uh, a, a side effect passing AB5 after, you know, the, the intent was to go after the Ubers, the Lyfts, the DoorDashes, the Instacarts, um, and those places to unionize them. But what they didn't see was um, actors, uh, phlebotomists, doctors, uh, real estate agents, insurance agents, almost every industry. So then they had to start doing carve outs because, oh, yeah, we didn't mean it for doctors or we didn't mean it for anesthesiologists or we didn't mean it for insurance agents or brokers. So they had to do all these carve outs, which created confusion. So you're either in the bill and under the rule of AB5, you're carved out of the bill because you um obviously Annie Depp and hired a lobbyist to get you out of it. So small actors, musicians, um, think about a wedding, uh, your wedding coordinator, just take a wedding, your wedding coordinator or your caterer or um, the musician, the quartet, right? The three people that come and play the violin while people are walking into your reception or whatever the case may be. Um, you would just write a check to them, you know? So at the, you know, so that they provide services to your wedding, but you're not allowed to do that anymore. And then the bill with the carve outs created a tremendous amount of confusion. And then to have the private right of action attached to it, which creates a PAGA lawsuit, people were so confused. They didn't know if they were an independent contractor, they weren't an independent contractor. You know, why can't they do that? They had to start their own business, but then AB5 said you could, you had to have more than one client. Well, Every small business that starts always starts with one one client, right? So then you're in violation of the law. It just created great confusion, and the Democrats even knew that. So they came back and tried to do some cleanup legislation. We introduced a repeal and several um, exceptions for more carve-outs, and then they came back. They killed all of our bills, but they did come back and do some cleanup legislation last cycle, and I anticipate there'll be more cleanup legislation this cycle, Um so, but we just don't have the numbers to do a real fix to AB5, which is, which is a disaster. Yeah. When we ran our ad about Lorena Gonzalez after she uh, decided to taunt Elon Musk, and I see that worked out well because uh, Mr. Musk has now moved to Texas and in a factory to Texas when we could have had those jobs and that expansion of growth here. I actually got some calls from some folks that were interpreters and they were interpreters that were independent contractors for the military and, and they would uh, deal with folks in Afghanistan and Iraq. So they're saying, hey, we might not even have a job and they don't know what to do. And it just shows you how short-sighted and, and blind on some of these laws that are attempted to be passed or that get passed. And it's, it's really, really unfortunate and it has to somehow stop there has to be some kind of a happy medium and and you know when you look at prop 22 i mean how many millions of dollars did they spend to get a carve out just just for them does everybody have to go to ballot initiatives and spend that kind of money to get something that's common sense i i don't know what, what do you think yeah it is it's no uh, you're exactly right there was um over 60 million dollars that was spent um, on, uh, you know, the Proposition 22, and you have to have a lot of money to be able to get out of, uh, um, you know, out of a situation like AB5, which is just unfair, completely unfair. And when you just think about the interpreters that you just men mentioned that do um, interpretation for the military, think about the simple interpreter that is a, a bilingual or a trilingual interpreter that is hired by a family, um, and they just write a check to, to you know, Shannon Grove interpreter or whatever, right? Just right. 
um, and that interpreter will set up um, court cases or that interpreter will go and, and work the court calendar and they'll translate from English to Spanish for a family that's maybe going through the court process. Now that family has to start a business. It has, you know, it, they can't independently hire that court interpreter and give them a check at the end of the day for the services rendered. It's absurd. Referees for our children's games, when we used to prior yeah, before COVID and our kids one. could play volleyball games or football games, you know, a referee come out, a retired, you know, somebody that was a, a coach at a high school and they come out and they do referee a game um, and it gives them an opportunity to earn a little extra money in a retirement position. And it gives a, our kids a fair, you know, playing field for referees that are fair and balanced. You can't even give them it. You can't even write them a check as an independent contractor. Yeah. There is such a aftermath of disaster because of this piece of legislation all to appease the unions and that that's all it was and just like you mentioned in the previous legislation that labor fed came out and said this would be detrimental to the wage and hour um you know the comment that you made about you know it would infringe on wage and hour issues for people that work at home it is so far left um for the employees of this great state that they have got to start waking up and vote correctly so that we can fix some of this nonsense. Oh, I agree. Do you um, do you see anything uh, in 2021 that any kind of power to reform? Do you think there's any chance of this happening uh, legislatively? So I can tell you that um, there are all Republicans want PAGA reform and there are Democrats that also want PAGA reform, but we have a very powerful appropriations chair on the assembly side who happens to be the author of um, AB5. And um, she has made it very, very clear in almost the way that, she, if, if not the way that she spoke about Elon Musk um, uh, publicly on her Twitter account, um, she has made it very clear that she is the only one who will do any type of reform if any reform does get done. So even her Democrat colleagues are not willing to bring forth uh, PAGA reform bills uh, because she's so powerful in the appropriations um, committee. And she's backed by, you know, the California Labor Federation. She's part of their 100% club, you know, votes 100% of the time for all of their issues. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think a big part of the problem is, is I'm not sure sometimes who's really running the state. Is it, is it uh, the legislation and the governor or is it just the California Labor Federation? I'm, I'm not sure because when it comes they to labor very laws, powerful. Yeah, they are. The Labor Fed is a very, very, very powerful force. Um, any labor, uh, whether it's the teachers union, Labor Fed, um, any of those labor unions are very, very powerful forces in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Shannon, we appreciate having you on the show. We thank you for your time. I don't know, is there anything else you wanted to add and, and tell us for 2021 that might be exciting? So we've got some great pieces of legislation. You know, we're gonna try to keep California working. We're gonna work on um, repeal processes for AB5 that will probably fall on deaf ears, but at least we can let people know what we're doing and hopefully they'll make good decisions at the next um, ballot box. Uh, we can also, um, we're looking at, some of the effects that COVID's had on our children, um, isolation, depression, uh, the achievement gap. So we've got a, a great children's package that we're going to introduce. And so, uh, you know, and there's still hope. I mean, there's hope because there's people like you, Tom, that have engaged um, above and beyond to organize people. There's hope because there are people like you that have engaged in the process and put out ads and are educating the public about the pieces of legislation that are happening. Because, you know, our traditional media is like, you know, the legislature. Well, it's really not the legislature. It's like the left-leaning Democrats that are doing this to our state. And so um, we appreciate everything that you're doing um, to make sure that there's, um, you know, education, good education is going on, not just to business owners, but to the employees and everybody. I mean, you guys take out full-page ads in major newspapers. So um, people that read that go, wow, that's, that's shameful that you know, Miss Gonzalez said what she said about Elon Musk, because even going to that one particular little thing right there, I know he left his plant here to have workers work here. And that's why they're like, oh, it's just him. But think about this for just a moment. We rely heavily on um, individual income taxes and earnings, right, for the state to have resources for schools, fire department, police department, all of that stuff to give to counties. And when you think about Elon Musk taking his income that he would pay into California to a different state, how many of us, how many of you and me, 
does it take to make up one Elon Musk? And I can tell you that number is probably bigger than we would ever possibly imagine. A lot, a whole lot. A A lot. lot. Well, we thank you for everything you do for the state of California. Uh, You know, you do such a great job that Anna and I considered moving to Bakersfield because we thought we want somebody that's really going to represent us and do a great job. Well, Shannon, uh, thanks again for coming on the show and and taking the the time to, uh, you know, do this. I know you're a very busy uh, person and keep up the good work. We appreciate everything you do for us. Well, thank you, Tom, very much for the opportunity to be on the show. And I'm very excited uh, to watch it when it comes out. And I really do applaud everything that you have done uh, to take on this PAGA situation and create a a great organization that will help um, move California forward. Trial lawyers in California are abusing a law called the Private Attorneys General Act, or PAGA, to get rich. And they're harming the state's small businesses, nonprofits, and even labor unions in the process. PAGA was signed into law in 2003 by then-Governor Gray Davis. He said it would empower workers. Instead, the law became a lucrative scam for trial attorneys. Here's how it works. Trial attorneys figure out that by threatening businesses with PAGA claims for labor code violations, they could quickly reach out-of-court settlements, sometimes for millions of dollars. Because the state labor code is more than 1,000 pages long, even the smallest misstep, like late lunches or a typo on a pay stub, can lead to a PAGA claim with crushing financial penalties. More than 35,000 PAGA notices have been sent to employers since 2004, but that doesn't mean employees are benefiting. In 2018, Uber settled a PAGA lawsuit for $7.8 million. The attorneys kept $2.6 million. The state took $3.6 million, and the drivers took home just $1.08 each. Other settlements are similar. One top PAGA attorney even admitted that the law was never intended to compensate employees. California needs to enforce its own labor laws and stop empowering trial attorneys to extort businesses and deceive employees. To learn more, visit cabia.org.